Hello everyone. I'm going to be recording a lecture for this week for the honours class because of course it's a public holiday on Monday. So we wanted to still give you access to the information. I'm working from home today so if there's an occasional dog bark that's my annoying neighbour's dog. I'm going to be talking about social construction and we kind of have to start with a guy called Alfred Schutz because philosophy is at the root of the idea of social construction rather than sociology. Sociologists have picked this up a little bit later and Alfred Schutz was an Austrian philosopher who was born in Vienna and then died in America. He was interested in phenomenology which is a branch of philosophy and which broadly means to investigate human phenomena or the objects or the stuff we can experience with our senses or in today's language would probably call that empirical empirical material so in contrast to the noumena or what's known by the mind which today we might call an analysis or theory so the noumenal is usually used to describe or explain the phenomenal or the theoretical is used to explain the empirical. So Schutz's position was that social science is different from the natural or physical sciences um, and sociology as you would know comes out of the idea that we should be able to examine and explain the social world in a similar way to what the natural scientists were doing with so-called natural world. But he was saying that it's actually different, that social science is different from the natural or physical sciences because people are already interpreting the world that social scientists want to interpret. So in other words, everyone is already trying to make sense of their social world. It's not just the social scientists doing that. And the social scientists, though, they're trying to make sense of how everyone else is making sense of things if that makes sense. So in a nutshell, phenomenology requires that we want to discover the world as it is being experienced by those involved in it. So it's not about testing hypotheses and it's not about being guided by theoretical models. Instead, researchers are expected to discover what participants are actually experiencing. So therefore, he suggested social scientists need to use similar methods to what ordinary people use in their sense making. For example, observation. If we want to learn how to do something new, we often observe other people doing it. However, he thought that the social scientist would take up the position of the detached or disinterested or the distant observer, which was an issue for feminists who argue that actually there can be no such no such position. In the 1960s, a couple of blokes, a couple of sociologists by the name of Peter Berger and Thomas Lookman took Schultz's ideas and extended them. They argued that human consciousness must be seen as the ultimate root of all social phenomena. They claimed that, and I'm quoting, social order is not biologically given or derived from any biological data in its empirical manifestations, but instead the patterns and regularities in human life are actually due to how human consciousness is structured. And I guess by consciousness, I'm thinking of thinking or awareness or perception. It's usually not a really nice definition of consciousness. And this is the, an ongoing human production that makes possible action and reaction but which also is produced and reproduced by these over time. So their view is a little bit like symbolic interactionism. Social reality that Berger and Lukman are talking about, um, they call paramount reality because they recognize that there are actually other realities. For example, when we dream, we experience a different reality. When we read a book or go to the movies, we kind of enter another world. But that kind of social world that we're all familiar with, that we come into, when when we get up in the morning they call the paramount reality. The other word that they often think about too is a life world so and a life world is formed by the culture or the values and beliefs of a particular group of people and it's the life worlds make action reaction and interaction actually possible but these in turn come to shape and reshape the life world over time. Let's go on and have a look at some of their ideas. 
in particular, they're interested in the, in the idea of human plasticity. And I can see that they're well and truly ahead of their time if I think about the neuroscience that goes on at the moment and the idea of brain plasticity. So they were interested in, they use the word plasticity as well. They're interested in how humans continue developing outside of the womb. Unlike horses, for example, which come out, get up and get on, humans uh, have to be nurtured because they are still developing. And that means they're already developing inside of a social world. And so therefore, they're actually being shaped by their environment, which they say, Bergman and Lukman, say is socially produced. They also say that we both are a body, we, we are a body, but we also have an awareness of ourselves of, as having a body as well. So they don't tend to ignore the body or have the a real separation necessarily between um, the mind and the body that came from Kant or that's often seen as the Cartesian dualism. Um, however, they really don't pay attention to the body in the same way that the second article when you're reading that Zoe is suggesting that we do. They do say, however, what, that what humans do is we externalize ourselves and we do that through language. So, you know, I'm going to tell you about what I'm thinking. So therefore, I'm taking myself outside of myself. I'm externalizing myself. We do that through symbol. We will have a symbol of the, of the flag, the Australian flag, for example. And that way, we kind of externally know. We don't have to tell everybody that we're Australian. We can just put a flag outside of our house if anyone does that sort of thing. And people know then that we're, we're Australian. So we externalize an aspect, I suppose, of our identity in that example. And we externalize our, ourselves, they say, by things. So if we want to, if we're very angry and aggressive, we might make a weapon like a gun or a knife or etc. And a, a knife is violent anyway, if we're using it to cut up something to eat or whether we use it against another human being. So we've externalized the feelings of, of anger and aggression and warlike feelings and we can use uh, to make a thing. So we are, so we're not just internal, we externalize ourselves. And that's an important aspect of their argument because they want to understand how humans then shape the world. They're very interested in the process of humans shaping the social world. And they do pick up some of these ideas do come from Schutz rather than Bergman and Lukman by habit. Hab Habitualisation or habitual ways of doing things save humans lots of time and energy. Sure, we have to learn how to do stuff in the first place, but then we slip into what sociologists call practical consciousness. That means that we go about doing things in an automatic way. So when I arrive home without having taken any notice really of how I've driven here, which is very alarming for anyone who drives with me when I tell them that, except that most of us do it. We get home and there'll be a part of that drive where we've slipped into habit and that frees us up then to be thinking or worrying about something else. So humans op operate a lot um, habitually because it does save us time and effort and energy as well. And they call, Bergman and, and uh, Berger and Lukman call the habitual ways that humans do things recipes. So we've got a particular recipe lodged for how to drive a car, how to dri drive a bus. There's a number of steps that we take in order to do these things. And we have those recipes, so they call that a recipe, um, just as there are a number of steps we take in, in using a recipe for, for cooking food. So we have these recipes, we learn the recipes, and then they become a habit and then we can forget about the recipe we can just go on and do things next aspect of what they're talking about are typifications again I think this is an idea that actually comes from shots but it's creating standard ways of doing things which makes again makes everybody's life very much easier well otherwise I mean I think the point of it is that otherwise it makes social life almost impossible so for example if I am talking to you and I'm talking about going to the to the police then you will have some idea in your mind of what a police looks like the uniform that they might wear the sort of person they are the sort of work 
that they do. So that's the typification. It's creating a standard way of doing things which makes life a whole lot easier. If I say to you, I'm going to catch the bus or I've caught the train in to work, then you have an idea of the sort of vehicle that I'm talking about. And I don't have to go on and explain that in a great deal of detail as I would need to for a child who hasn't yet learnt that. So we use these typifications which build into kind of a shared history and then they are transmitted to the next generation. It would be much too hard to be living if we couldn't have some sort of basic assumptions about everyday life. They kind of form the basis. Habits and typifications therefore form the basis of all our thought and action and therefore they become the, the basis of all our interactions as well. So daily life, I argue, is basically the use of typifications in the practical consciousness of human, of human beings. And the practical consciousness is where we op operate most of the time. Most of our everyday life, they reckon, is, happens at this level of habitual doing, this practical con consciousness level. And we, we can be jolted out of it. And certainly if something happens, like we have an accident and we can no longer use our right arm, then of course we're not going to be able to do things in the same way. So we'll be jolted out of that. Or if somebody asks why our credit card payments are late, then suddenly we have to think things through. So we move out of practical consciousness into something that call a more self-conscious discursive consciousness to think things through and to justify why we have to do things or um, how we have to learn how to do things. Habitualizations and typifications then become institutionalized ways of doing things. And so that's the next point that I want to make, that social institutions, and by that I mean the family relationships, gender relationships, relations of authority and subordination, they, I say, are simply alienated, objectified human objects. There's nothing real, natural, unavoidable, or inevitable about them. And yet that's how people experience them. We experience family relationships, gender relationships, relationships of authority and subordination. Unless we've been doing some thinking about this, jolting ourselves out of practical consciousness, that's the way that we usually experience them. So these institutions then exert social control. This is the way that we do things. It no longer seems like a choice. It seems natural, the only way to do it. And of course, that then becomes the externalized social world. So interaction generates this habituation and institutionalization. And once children are born into such a situation, they then go through a process of internalization. So essentially, the inculcation, the learning of the typifications and the recipes of the life world of their parents or carers. So a new generation begins to and think about children's books. If I think about the, the, the books that I was teaching my uh, reading to my very young children, then there were about things like dogs and cats and other things in the social world and buses and cars so that they could have those typifications so that I could talk to them about what a car was and we'd have that general understanding. So the whole new generation then begins to see the world in light of this paramount reality or the paramount reality of their parents and care caregivers, at least initially. So the parents or the caregivers' life world then becomes the children's life world. And the children, of course, begin to behave like the carers and help reproduce the life world. Deviance then from the norm is usually punished. So children are socialized to fit into society and deviances, there'll be you know, very mild sort of punishments perhaps in some situations to, to quite severe one for children who don't fit in. Children eventually learn that this is a typification. Every, n nobody spills their soup, for example. They might learn that at home, but eventually as they go out, they find that's a, a typification. We all learn to not spill our soup at dinner. So then the knowledge that's transmitted to the next generation becomes the knowledge, but it's the knowledge of the social, of the social world.
And institutions, of course, are then embodied through the roles that we take. The roles that in the past have, been, or have also been gendered, also been about gendered relationships. So the mother and the father and the particular roles that they take, just even being the mother and the father, are roles that we have, or, or, or teachers, other roles that we take, or the police that I've, I've been talking about before. These are all roles that we play in a shared social world. And then legitimation of the social reality is then done through explaining and justifying. And, there, that, and that can be very simple through to very mythological and very extensive and quite frankly very interesting. So religion has a number of ways of explaining the you know, typifications and habitualizations of, of ancient society which is then carried down through modern times. That's one way of explaining things. You could argue that science is another way of explaining things. So, so the way in which we do things, which we pass on to our children, say this is the way that things are done, and when they ask why, which they will do, we then explain and justify that as well. Or we suddenly get a jolt out of paramount consciousness and wonder why ourselves. This internalisation of reality, Bergman and Lookman talk about two levels of that. There's the primary socialisation, which happens as a child when the child learns to be a member of a society. So a member of society in the, in the very microcosm of the family and then extending out as they learn to get on with other people. The child then takes on the roles and the attitudes of others, therefore also taking on their world. For the child internalises they stress this point that the child internalises the world of significant others, not a world, that the world becomes quite entrenched, that primary socialisation. Secondary socialisation, if you think about when we then send children off to school, they internalise the institutions and the roles and get taught all of that. It's not as emotionally charged as it is in the primary socialisation. You know, you love your mother but you don't necessarily love your teacher and you don't have to there's, there's certainly no rules about that but you'd be seen as a strange person if you didn't love your mother so there is a social rule about that and there's an impersonality about the roles I learn how to be a teacher but anybody can learn how to be a teacher in fact so there's anybody can because I know we have rules about who can be a teacher or not but anybody can learn how to do that. They reckon because of the entrenched nature of that primary socialisation that we need a sort of severe biographical shock, which they don't really explain what that could be, are needed to disintegrate them, that massive primary socialisation where it takes much less to destroy the realities that are internalised later on. So the primary one is the most significant one. I guess thinking back, to, to be fair, one of those shocks that they might, even though they don't really talk about it as shock, but they do talk about the situation of a child who might be living in an upper upper class family and yet being cared for by somebody from a working class background, so a nanny or whatever from a different class background. And that then kind of gives the child a choice of two life worlds. And that child then might make a choice to move from one to, to the other, have a more of affinity. So that, that child gets a little bit more choice, I guess, than the child who just has the one, the, the world, as they say, of their significant others. They have to do some maintenance of this social reality. And we do that via casual conversation. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about casual conversation or conversation in a minute when I introduce the work of Harold and Garfinkel. Well, we do that through casual conversation. So if I say I'm late for a lecture and somebody responds, OK, I better not keep you, it kind of it implies this whole world, this whole subjective reality that I don't need to explain. Now, again, if I use the example for children, I might need to explain that. But if I'm talking to a colleague or to another student, we know what we're talking about when we talk about being late for a lecture. So we can talk in this shorthand, and that goes that does follow on nicely to the work of Harold Garfinkel in a minute. We re reality maintenance also happens via social sanctions against some behaviour, some observations you might might make if they 
it might be just seen as weird and that therefore you'll be subject to ridicule or there'll be taboos and there's been a lot of taboos over the years that may have been broken down now but taboos for example about talking about mental ill health therefore there's been social uh, social sanctions we don't want to talk about that we're pretending that that doesn't exist in our social particular social reality and thankfully that is now changing and then the other way in which reality can be maintained, if you've had some sort of breakdown or you're not really fitting into reality so, so well at the moment, you can go and see somebody like a therapist. Bergman and Lookman see that as kind of a, a ritualised way of reintegrating a person into this particular social reality. They reckon that biological factors, this is a quote, biological factors limit the range. So they don't dismiss biology at all, but, but it limit the range of social possibilities open to any individual. But the social world, which is pre-existent to each individual, in its turn imposes limits on what is biologically possible to the organism. And for example, life expectancy varies with social location. It varied in 1961 when they were writing, and we know that it varies now. It varies depending on whether you come from quite a poor background. It, it varies if you uh, are an Aboriginal person in Australia as well. Then again, it varies whether depending on whether you live in a rural situation or live in an urban setting. The poor people are ill far more frequently than upper class people and have different illnesses. So we don't ignore the biological factors, but what they're saying is that the social ones are impacting on the biology all the time. They also go to say, on to say in their very androcentric language, that man is driven by his biological constitution to seek sexual release and nourishment, but satisfaction of these needs are actually channeled in specific directions socially rather than biologically. So we're constrained socially rather than biologically. A channeling that not only imposes limits, and I'm quoting again, but affects the functioning of the organism. Therefore, they conclude, social reality determines not only activity and consciousness, but to a considerable degree, our organic functioning as well. So I'm going to move on to Harold Garfinkel. He was an American born in 1917. His father was a furniture dealer and he wanted his son to follow him into the family business. But young Harold decided to get a degree in accounting although he did help his father out with the family business, which is a very interesting, but kind of makes sense to me when I think about Harold Garfinkel's interest in very fine detail, that that kind of goes with that accounting background. He had a very formative experience volunteering at a, at a Quaker work camp after he had graduated from college. And this experience opened his eyes up to diversity for the first time and actually influenced his decision to go into sociology. He's got a story included in an anthology called The Best Stories, 1941. A short story that's really, that interestingly enough to me, is, is preceded by the great William Faulkner's story, Gold Is Not Always, in which is included with other luminaries like Richard Wright and Daphne du Maurier and Graham Greene. Apparently not many sociologists know of Garfinkel's short story. So he wrote this story called Colour Trouble while employed as a social researcher for eminent sociologist Howard Odom. And Colour Trouble began life in 1940 in another journal, a journal of Negro life, interestingly enough. After the 1941 book, it appeared again in a primer for, for white folks. He was an eyewitness to some events, which was the story of a young black woman from New York City, Alice McBean, her name was. And she was traveling on a bus with a friend throughout the state of Virginia. And she refused to comply with the state's segregation laws. She was supposed to sit with her friend at the back of the bus, which of course reminds me of Rosa Parks, who in 1955 did something very similar in Alabama. But she was not sitting like Rosa Parks at the front of the bus. She's sitting right in the middle. And the bus driver calls the police. Alice continues to resist. She refuses to go to the back, back of the bus and she's arrested. Alice provides what Harold Garfinkel goes on to call, later call, a breaching experiment. 
she does something against the social rules, against the social norms, and she is punished for it. But he was intrigued about what does happen when we breach and how we maintain, most of the time, we maintain this social, common social reality. His studies were interrupted by the Second World War, and then he went on to study at Harvard University with Talcott Parsons, who was a very influential American sociologist. I want to talk about a little bit about his field, which he came to call ethnomethodology. So the definition of that is the study of methods people use to make sense of the social world they are part of. So ethno is a particular group of people, for example, social science students. Method is a technique for gathering data or information or doing something. And ology is a systematic or scientific description of these methods. He developed something called conversation analysis, where he had his students conduct a number of experiments in order to understand the methods or the processes that people use to create a shared sense of reality. Instead of discussion tutorials, he had students make a shift from the taken for granted or beyond their habits and routines to the properties that actually constitute the recognisable order in any setting in order to figure out what was going on. So one example that Anne Rouse uses is that students might have to do ordinary tasks while wearing headgear, I think he does some bizarre things, while wearing headgear that distorted their vision. And so the idea was to do that disruption, the disruption to disrupt the everyday so that hidden assumptions are revealed. So if you wear glasses as I do, try not wearing them for a while and it will reveal some assumptions. And I've done that and it does for me, reveals my preference to be dependent on technology like glasses rather than on people as I would be if I didn't wear glasses, for example, driving. Without exercises to do, Garfinkel actually found that students had a great deal of difficulty questioning the taken for granted, and so he gave them things to do. By examining conversations, he spawned a whole field of knowledge called conversation analysis, and it's used in the workplace and by marketers to optimise their selling approaches. Harvey Sachs was a very early key player, if you're interested in following that up. Deborah Tannen, I think, has done some fabulous work in conversation analysis. She's examined the conversations between mothers and daughters, between wives and husbands and between partners, heterosexual I think. So you could have a look at some of those. She, she writes in a really accessible way, very, very interesting, and it gives you an idea of the sort of work that Garfinkel did pioneer. One of the experiments that Garfinkel had students do was unpacking the shorthand used by partners when talking to each other. Where the husband says, Dana succeeded in putting a penny in a parking meter today without being picked up. Now, if the husband wanted to tell this to anyone other than his partner, he would need to give a lot more information, a much longer version. For example, this afternoon, as I was bringing Dana, our four-year-old son, home from nursery school, he succeeded reaching high enough to put a penny in a parking meter when we parked in a meter parking zone, whereas before, he's always had to be picked up to reach that high. That's an example of the shorthand, and we often do talk in shorthand all the time. If we're talking to somebody that we don't know so well, we need to give a longer extended version of it, explain ourselves a whole lot more. So a couple of the observations that he makes about conversation is that much of the conversation didn't have to be in this longhand. What was not said formed part of the understanding. So it's not, so a conversation is not just about what's said, it's also about what's not said. And we expect that people will understand what we're saying and people will wait to hear more so there'll be a little gap. And so we monitor whether people have received what we've said and whether they're looking questioning or quizzical or waiting. And then if they do look puzzled, we're puzzled. And if they look puzzled, we'll go on. So these are all features in the background of a conversation. If you try bringing them to the foreground, people get upset. So you could experiment with, for example, asking for a clarification. So if I were to come home and somebody at home said to me, well, we had a flat tire today, and I said, or I asked, oh, what do you mean a flat tire? 
they'd probably get a little bit irritated with me because we know that we know what a flat tire is. Now, if they're talking to somebody from a different culture or to a small child, they would expect to be, I have to do that longer elaboration of what was meant, of what was meant by a flat tire. But, you know, I've lived in this society for a long time. I share this social reality. Therefore, they'll expect that I should know what a flat tire is and they'll be a bit bemused and confused and probably a bit aggro too if I keep on asking for explanation. But he did do that. He, he had, Garfinkel had students question what people actually meant when they did say, for example, I had a flat tire. And that is the experience. Most people did find it really annoying and really irksome. Someone close to me hadn't read Garfinkel but was reading Socrates and questioning everything I said one day. And we were travelling home in the car and I, I noticed that I got increasingly irritated, really annoyed. So he wasn't reading Garfinkel, he was reading Socrates. And Socrates had a habit of asking irritating questions too. When I thought about, so I hadn't thought about Garfinkel, I just got annoyed. But when I got to thinking about Garfinkel, I realised that I was annoyed because the rules, the rules of a conversation as a two-way conversation weren't being followed. In other words, somebody was asking me the questions, doing an inter what I would call an interrogation, instead of participating in a conversation which ideally is an even exchange with minimal silences. And there weren't very many silences, but the person had broken the conversation rule about the exchange. Suppose I find that I do get irritated by people too who do all the talking because they break this rule of exchange as well. So it's in the, in the breaking of the rules that we become aware of. We can take notice of what it is that we're getting irritated about or find out about the rules that are there that are quite implicit that we might not be aware of. Garfinkel also had students go and do a whole range of what he called breaching experiments. So he was getting students, with the, like with the conversation, getting them to deliberately break unwritten rules. He also got them to do that in other ways. So he got them to, he wanted to see how they would respond or react. He wanted to see also whether they would have the courage to do these breaching experiments and he wanted to see what happened. So he was interested in the whole process. And when the students came and reported all these, they did report things like the anxiety they felt about doing a breaching experiment, the time they spent mentally rehearsing in, a, in advance. This was not something habitual. This was something new. The length of time they were willing to actually spend in it. So the sorts of things that they would do was one was like being a boarder at home and students noticed things like there was a whole lot less attention to impression management if you went from so these are students who were living at home anyway and they pretended they were boarders instead of a family member so they noticed that there was a lack of uh, table manners they noticed a lack of civility and noticed noticed that people didn't bother trying to impress so that's what i mean by press impression management they found it very difficult though to maintain this pretense. And so, for example, if you were being a boarder rather than a family member, you might not go to the fridge as freely as you would if you were a family member. And so one student in particular kept on asking if they could have some food. And the mother in the example just got really irritated. She said, look, you know, for 21 years, you've just been helping yourself to food in the fridge. What's going on? So they found that it was actually very difficult to sustain this pretense because the students were accused of behaving differently. Family members got really, sometimes they were just amused, but more often than not, they were actually quite annoyed with them. Another example was pretending that everyone they spoke with was untrustworthy, that they should be suspicious of their motives. And this was particularly difficult for some students who felt they were playing some artificial game. And therefore it highlighted for them how we actually go around trusting people to be who they present them to be. Most of the time we do take people on what we call face value. Lots of other ways to do breaching experiments and it's probably a good idea I reckon to observe your own. Even though I'm aware of the emotional labour that goes into retail work, work that employees don't explicitly get paid to do, I still prefer interacting with retail staff who smile. Now this is an unwritten social rule that those who serve us should be pleasant or at least smile and welcome. And when they don't, when they break this rule, I feel affronted. 
And so that brings to mind for me that there is this expectation on my part that somebody has broken a rule. Another experiment I'm aware of via YouTube is American students going around in a supermarket putting items into other people's trolleys. Yeah, am I brave enough to do that? I challenge you to be brave enough to do that and think about the reactions that you get and how long you're willing to do it. Or imagine standing up on a bus or train when it's almost empty and there's no need to stand up. Would you be willing to breach the social rules is that we don't stand up usually unless there's no seats. Or imagine going into a uni lecture and standing out the front instead of obeying the unwritten rule and sitting down waiting for the lecturer who's the only person allowed to stand out the front. Often small children unwittingly break all the social rules because they've not yet been taught them. So we could probably hang out with two-year-olds for a while in order to find out what the rules are that we've forgotten learning. There'll come a point at which we won't have any tolerance for those children. We will have expect them to learn the social rules. One of the things that we do at, at Adelaide Uni for international students is introduce them to the unspoken rules of Australian life so they can settle in more quickly than if they had to, to figure it all out for themselves. And that's what we call acculturation. And really we're just introducing them to our life world, our social reality, our ways of doing things. Garfinkel also did work in an assortment of workplaces um, and he's got a book if you're interested studies in ethno methodology where he writes up all of this weird stuff that he does which is very interesting so in one example he had researchers working at a psychiatric outpatient clinic and they were going to code all the clinic files but they couldn't because they found them hopelessly incomplete but Garfinkel found that the incompleteness was not random they didn't actually represent patient histories at all. Instead, the case studies or the files were actually designed to meet the institution's need for internal and external accountability. So they weren't really about the patients, which is why the researchers found it so hard to get the information from them. Rather than the files being a patient history, which is what they were called, they were more a history of how clinic workers kept files and why they kept files the way that they did. For example, there wasn't actually much in the way of demographic information on patients because workers didn't have the time in those sort of pre-computerised days to get that information. They relied on what they could see. So they could see a person's age or sex but not other data like their annual income. An example of institutional records meeting institutional needs and not having much to do at all with people as they are, are records maintained by the various departments of child protection around the country. And people who as children had files kept on them have gone and looked at those records at adults and absolutely been appalled to find stuff said about them, for example, that they were mentally retarded. And judgments that were made about children and young people in the care of the state actually became facts about those children and young people. And these could be about a family situation, a child's behaviour, whether there was compliance to rules and regulations. Once judgment was made about a child or young person, for example, that they were unruly or unmanageable, or if they were mentally retarded, that's the way that they would actually be treated. So if we return to thinking about Durkheim, which you might not have been done. I've been thinking about Durkheim for another course, so that's why he's on my mind. But as one of the, you know, one of the patriarchs of sociology and the social facts he was investigating of suicide, actually Garfinkel argued that these social facts were actually not so much social facts, but opinion of police officers, which then go into legal judgments about the nature of a death. How this all happens is the result of other studies, which are outlined in some books about Garfinkel, if you wanted to look that up. But the police make decisions based on whether the death was made by hanging or whether the death was through gassing, as opposed to something that looks like an accident, for example, a car which is ploughed into a stoby hole. And then they also consider the likelihood of whether someone would have the motive for killing themselves, for example, if they were lonely or had recently had quite devastating news. So these so-called social facts that Durkheim was interested in are therefore socially produced. So Garfinkel demonstrated the active role that people play in producing facts and social institutions with the case of Agnes. Garfinkel was a researcher at the Department of Psychiatry at 
the University of California in Los Angeles in 1958. And Agnes, a woman was referred there because she wanted to undergo surgery. She's a trans woman. She wanted to undergo surgery to have a penis and testicle surgically removed. She was 19 years old. She was white. She was single and she was supporting herself as a typist for a local insurance company. She was the youngest of four children raised by a single mum. She made a deal with the psychiatric team that if she spent some time talking with Garfinkel that she could have the surgery at a reduced cost. And this gave Garfinkel an opportunity to, to examine how she managed to accomplish the successful passing, he called it, as a woman. And yet Agnes had been a boy, had a boy's name, was recognised by everyone who knew her as a boy, at least until the age of 17 when she left home and decided to present herself as a woman. Then of conversations with Garfinkel, Agnes revealed that she was never comfortable as a boy. The male role was difficult. She managed it very poorly. And around the age of 12, she began to grow breasts because she used her mother's prescription estrogen, which her mother was taking because of a hysterectomy. And the child would have their prescription filled on her own using money she had taken from her mum's purse. At the time, she didn't know what the effect would be, but she knew it was something for females. Once she had left home, Agnes became, according to Garfinkel, preoccupied with looking and behaving like a woman. What interested Garfinkel about Agnes was that gender must be socially managed. So this is in the days before, we might think about this quite a lot now, but this is in the days um, gender was seen as, as natural. So in order to pass as a woman, Agnes actually had to learn how to reproduce all of the actions, the expressions, the posture, the gestures, the ways of passing. Rather than assuming that gender is biological, and so in this, Garfinkel was pretty radical, I think, for the time, he began to think about it as socially produced and reproduced, and he wanted to know how she went about using the methods that women use in order to reproduce as herself as a woman. So he wanted to understand what she did, and that was what their com conversations consisted of. So the whole conversation between them is actually one of the very earliest recorded discussions of gender as a social rather than a biological phenomenon. And again, if you're interested in that study, you'll find it in Garfinkel's book, Studies in Ethno Methodology. Agnes saw herself as biologically or naturally female and wanted removal of the penis and testicles because they were an unnatural growth like a cancerous tumour. That's how she saw it. But Garfinkel saw Agnes as an accomplished woman, as a woman who'd become one, not been born one, but become one through adopting the methods that biological females used in their gender roles as women. And at an age when most people's gender would already be accomplished and quite routine, think about how, how that's habituated, Agnes had to think through how to act, what to wear, etc. So she had to examine the recipes, the steps that are taken for applying makeup, for walking, etc., before they could be habituated. Some examples of her learning to replicate methods used by women were actually taught by her boyfriend's mother. So her boyfriend's mother taught her how to cook because in those days that was a woman's thing to do, to make clothes, to go shopping, to manage a home. And they were all of the hallmarks of being a successful woman in the 1950s and 1960s. And she also learnt through her boyfriend Bill who would tell her off when she wasn't acting like a lady. That, that's some of the sanctions that, sanctions against that I was talking about before. And the other thing she did was hang out with female friends. And they were occasions of instructions, including how to be passive as a desirable trait in a woman. So as Anne Ryle say, Agnes therefore is an important example or source of information of how it is that women reproduce themselves as gendered beings. And Agnes then turns up in a classic article on doing gender rather than being a gender or being a gendered being, written by Candace West and Don Zimmerman. And they argue that gender is more than a role, which at the time was where feminists were at, were thinking about that, and more than a display, which was where Goffman, Irving Goffman was at, but rather, and I'm quoting from them, participants in interaction organise their various and manifold activities to reflect or express gender and they are disposed to, to, to perceive the behaviour of others in a similar light. In other words, there's nothing natural about gender, it's all social. It is, in their words, not a set of traits, 
nor a variable nor a role, but the product of social doings of some sort. And this is in stark contrast to the then prevailing and still prevailing in some circles view that gendered behaviour results from and can be predicted by reproductive functions. So the social doing of gender maintains inequalities between women and men, with women usually in the subordinate positions doing less valued work, including the caring for children, elderly, sick, disabled, etc. And it's a bit of a catch-22, say Western Zimmerman, and I'm quoting again from them. If we do gender appropriately, we simultaneously sustain, reproduce and render legitimate the institutional arrangements that are based on sex category. If we fail to do gender appropriately, we as individuals, not the institutional arrangements, we as individuals may be called to account for our character, our motives. But they were writing back in 1987, so maybe things have changed. So in summary, social constructionists see the social world as a social product. There are a range of sociologists interested in this. There's the, those interested in the sociology of knowledge, which is uh, Berger and Lukman. There's the symbolic interactionist, and then there's the ethno-methodologist, which stems from the work of Harold Garfinkel. So all of that is very interesting, but Zoe, she does make a valid point. We also need to consider the actions, reactions, and interactions with the non-human world. So I think that's the next step then in, in social construction. So thank you for your time.